Hawks are hot. Mm -hmm. We're a couple minutes. Well, you always want to meet ours. 732. 732. <laughs> All right. I'll also make a motion to get this roll once. So moved. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Camera's hot. Are we recording? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Kareem has some introductions. Yeah, we have two guests that went today. We have uh, Leah on set. Did I say your last name right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, she's from The Courier. Um, I think she's uh, kind of assuming a little bit of the role that uh, Sarah Arthur's uh, did fulfill the last few years. We're covering, you know, uh, health issues in um, in the uh, Hancock County. Um, they has been doing a great job so far, and we're looking forward to, her, you know, to have her in our meetings and to pick up on stories that are of interest to, to the citizens. So welcome, Leah. Mr. Myron Lewis, uh, CEO and president of the uh, Blanchard Valley, will be joining us around nine o'clock. Um, to meet and greet with the board and kind of um, he always since he came to town he wanted to visit and it's always been you know COVID and everything else so um, he would like to come and kind of um, look at see how we're structured a little bit talk to leadership a little bit about what they do so uh, we'll welcome him around nine o'clock but other than that that's all you have okay yes we need to look at today's agenda items uh, 2.1 and approve today's agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, meeting minutes. Has anybody noticed anything on the meeting minutes from November 18th that we need to adjust? Nothing. All right, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from? The November 18th meeting. So moved. Second. All right, Kareem, is there anything we should know about the bill schedule? I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. We didn't have anything um, unusual as far as bills for this uh, for November. Uh, probably next month we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, December a little bit. We had a little bit of expense on the on the small heating unit. Um, the nursing section um, that's end up costing us about uh, five thousand dollars. So we'll we'll talk about it next time. Uh, but that's been replaced. I think uh, Laura was complaining too much and she was uh, freezing. A lot of uh, <laughs> Shannon's team clients as well on that section there. Uh, but I think it, we were we were happy that um, that it's a small unit that 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 went out and I think uh, we're still doing good on the other stuff. So, but um, for this uh, bill cycle, I, I don't see anything the ordinary there. 54 degrees was a little bit too cold. Mm. <laughs> Did we see no comment? <laughs> so you went to big lots? <laughs> Heated vests for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Dress appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's like that rake. Sometimes fixing them these days are a rough. All right. <laughs> Any other questions with the bill schedule? Do we have a motion to approve the November 22 bill schedule? So moved. Second. Okay. And all those in favor? Oh. Aye. All right. All right. Okay. So now we need to recognize some revenue. Yes, we uh, would like the Board of Health to approve and recognize the following revenue for fiscal year ending on December 31st of this 2022. Um, 2.4.1, it's a mobile health clinic. That's a community foundation award for the A1C machine in the amount of $3,000 even. 2.4. Point two, that's a mobile health clinic. That's a community foundation award. Uh, for youth diabetes program in the amount of eight hundred forty three dollars and no cents and two point four point three that's COVID enhanced operation project in the amount of ten thousand dollars and what's that about um this is uh this is a state um uh, uh, state grant that's coming to kind of uh, help us with the uh, for the COVID operation from all aspects of it um, vaccination organization of the clinics and uh, 
uh, and some other expense associated with it. Any other questions about the recognizing this revenue? Do we have a motion to approve uh, 2.41, 2.42, and 2.43? So revenues. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. Um, 2.5 would like the Board of Health to approve an appropriation decrease now, just to clean up before we end the year uh, to the following fiscal year ending on December 31st, 2022. Uh, item 2.5.1. Um, if you all remember, we received an award from the Community Foundation a few years back um, for the Prevent T2, uh, Prevent Type 2 Diabetes uh, uh, Initiative. Um, that did not get spent because of COVID, because that program was heavily relying on forming groups and peer supports and stuff like that. That didn't happen because they didn't get together. Um, so I did ask the foundation earlier this year to kind of be able to use that money towards the continuous glucose monitoring project that we're working on with Dr. Grace and the hospital. Um, and they agreed. So um, just to clean up and close up that project for this year, we're moving, uh, we're decreasing the appropriation in the Prevent T2, and we're moving it all to the mobile health operations. In 2.5.2, this is the, the Safe Community Project um, in the amount of $22,952.76. Um, that's uh, that's deliverable based, and um, uh, we um, we're ending the year just cleaning up again. Um, that's the uh, the traffic and and the the safety uh, projects that uh, that our health educator is working on, um, and we would like um, again to clean up the online item and start new next year um, with uh, decreasing the appropriation for that uh, that project. So does that money get uh, moved someplace, or for does? No, what we do, what we do, yes. Well, for the first item, this will get moved into um, into the mobile health clinic. Right. Like I said, the second one will be moved into next year's budget. Okay. All right. These are uh, both over ten thousand. So uh, two point five point one. Do we have a motion to approve this appropriation decrease? So moved. Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. 2.5.2. Uh, do we have a motion to approve this decrease? Don't move. 52. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, now we're up to the third and final reading for the proposed 2023 environmental health fees. Um, I would. Um, I want to let Lindsay give us a quick uh, rundown on how did the public hearing went yesterday. <laughs> so yesterday was the public comment period from <laughs> eight to nine here at the office. Um, I'm happy to say there were nobody attended. Um, we also had it set up um, with the help of Cheryl. She put this all out on social media. We also had it on our website where people could provide feedback through social media or to our emails or even give a phone call to any of the environmental staff and crickets. And even as the inspectors were out, we thought maybe a food you know, operator would comment crickets. <laughs> so I'm going to consider that no news is good news. <laughs> I, indeed, that that is good news. That means you know nobody's unhappy with the fees that the Board of Health is installing into next year. We talked about big reduction because of, we didn't invest the time, and usually we're time with that. Um, so I think everybody's happy with the little lower fees uh, going into next year. So at this time, we would like a motion to approve a, a, the final reading and um, effective immediately. Those uh, once you guys vote on it. Uh, they will become effective as the fees for next year. So we need a first a roll call. On this we'll one. do a roll call. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion to approve 2.6, the final reading of the environmental health fees sure. adjustment? So moved. Second. All right. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Robin? Yes. Bill? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Dr. Linda Moon? Yes. All right. Motion passed. Those are the fees for next year. All right. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the finances in November here. Just 
just a quick. Um, that's the plan to try and over November in particular, and we'll show the whole year. Um, so we are. Um, we started the year with a million six hundred twenty-seven thousand seven hundred ninety-five dollars and thirty-five cents in cash. And as of the end of November, we are uh, our cash is one million six hundred twenty-six thousand six hundred twenty-four dollars and fifty-seven cents. Um, so it's looking good so far um, in the year. That we tapped into only about a thousand uh, dollars of our our cash, and we're hoping that in December we'll, we'll get caught up and um, it will be will end the year in, in the black here again. So it's uh, nothing unusual. I think we're um, we're still managing our finances pretty well um, uh, to that extent, and uh, another successful year here. Uh, from what I'm sitting right now, so hopefully December will sh it's showing the same trend as well. On the flip page, this is a this is a balance sheet from the last seven years. This is showing to compare, um, and. Um, as uh, we did, uh, as far as revenue, we did bring uh, bring in two hundred ninety two thousand hundred nine dollars and sixty five cents in revenues in November. Um, we're bringing the total for the year to um, three million seven hundred seventy two thousand eight hundred and fourteen fourteen dollars and eighty seven cents. And we've expensed so far this year three million um, five hundred. $39.936 and uh, 8 cents. So, and all in all, we're still bringing a little more than what we're expensing, and um, that's what um, the prediction will end, uh, will end the year on end up the black again. So, will the uh, December revenue uh, be like some other years or what? Uh, well, if we compare, we're, we're expecting that the revenue in December will be closer to 2020. Uh, now we're kind of beyond the pandemic a little bit, so it's um, uh, we have a lot of catching up to do on billing and stuff like that, so it might be a little higher, a little lower, um, but um, there's not going to be big variance, you know, there. It's pretty, pretty consistent for previous years. So the difference between the uh... Revenue and the expenses, <clears throat> which is, uh, you know, hundred and some thousand, but our balances on the other other side haven't changed that much. Is that just because of their things in transit? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So we will, um, again, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll close the books by the end of December here, and we'll do the January meeting. We'll we'll bring in what happened, not only for December but for this whole. I think we keep coming back with the good news about the budget and us um, really living within the means and the resources we have. Um, I just want to uh, shout out, you know, to all the leadership and and the staff who are really um, being efficient and um, and being fiscally responsible with them. But I think we're, we're building up quite good, and I think we're, we're in a good place right now. Any questions about our financial um, well-being here? All right, Dr. Coase, you're next. A um, <clears throat> couple of issues uh, first uh, related to COVID. And we did talk about that yesterday, so you can tell me if I'm consistent with what I said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't get all that article read. <laughs> We are seeing more cases. Uh, it's not anything that's uh, unmanageable. Now, when I say we, now I'm talking about from the healthcare system, and I think what we're seeing in the community, there's overlapping of concern about respiratory infections in general. <clears throat> RSV, respiratory syncytial virus in kids, um, really jumped up in October. I think we talked about that. That's pretty much leveled off. Influenza is on the rise. Um, one of the questions you get asked, we don't always test for influenza. A. We're having a hard time. Uh, there's not a lot of availability just to find the, 
swab to test whether it's influenza A or what it is. It does appear the flu shot that is available is <coughs> taking care of or at least helping with that. So you have you have the influenza problem, and then we when we start. So um, ten days ago, we had four or five people on average in the hospital. Jumped up to 17 on Monday. It was down to 12. I know BJ's not here, so I don't know what today's. But um, that numbers that we had had in the hospital before about half of those. So if there were four or five, two or three were incidental meaning they might have come in with heart failure. We check everyone that comes into the hospital to see if they have COVID because of just where we will isolate or not, even though they may be fairly asymptomatic. Uh, now it's two or three still incidental. The other of the 17, 14 of those were um, admitted because of the respiratory problems, which are primarily shortness of breath, uh, can't breathe kind of things. We're not we're not having as many people that are being admitted to the ICU. We don't have as many people on ventilators. We don't have as many people dying. It's uh, as much as anything a capacity. At least yesterday we weren't holding anybody in the emergency room, but uh, we were full. We had 135 in the hospital, which is just about our capacity. Um, we've op opened back up the fourth floor. And we still have OB and um, the psychiatric unit with some beds, but um, it's been a been a problem, especially because of the workforce just staffing. Right now, we're able to take care of everyone. We've been able to get things in. So, uh, part of Kareem and I talked earlier this week is again encouraging the public to take care of themselves. I think this is a bump from Thanksgiving, um, which was expected. Everyone getting together. Everyone's going to be getting together at Christmas, and so encouraging everybody should be getting their vaccines. I think natural immunity has improved like in general people are getting um either they've had their vaccines or they've been exposed uh, i read something last night is now uh, covid just part of a common cold the problem with saying that is there's still this long covid again anecdotally i talked to somebody last night school teacher it's been three months for her and she's just really still having problems with having had that. And um, so not, I'm not ready anyhow to just say, well, it's, it's just something that we we're, we're going to live with. We still want to be as uh, judicious as what we can. So does anybody have any questions? Monkeypox has not been a problem. I don't know of anything. Else. Is there anything else? Texas no, I just thought just to yeah. I think to um, to follow up with the, the COVID. Um, you all heard that we're in the middle of a triple um, endemic now or pandemic. Um, flu is very high here in town. It's very high in Ohio. Um, and um, if you look at the at, um, at the graph a little bit, um, we started a little early here with a little peak, then um, then you know leveled off a little bit, um, but really um, shot um, shot back up around you know. Uh, the middle of the week 48 that's that's the week so it's a season um this is the baseline based on the last five years what we've seen here um in town um and it looks like we start to come down a little bit um uh, in week uh, 49 um we'll report next week on week 52 and 50, uh, 51 and 52 the week after and that will take us into the end of the year um we're not expecting the flu season to be totally complete until week 20 into the new year. So uh, we still have quite a bit of weights to go. Um, the flu is very high uh, and we're um, we're getting a lot of um, a lot of complaints about that. Um, not much typing uh, like Dr. Coe said, they don't do subtype any form uh, any time for type A. Um, they've seen a little bit of, um, you know, H3. Um, about the same amount of H1N1. Um, so we're, they seem to think that it's most what's circulating is type A and, and the vaccine is effective. I guess that too. So uh, it's a message. We want out. Um, it's about it on the table. Yep. Questions about it. The, the second thing is uh, my highlight, highly diagrammatic uh, board. <laughs> um, talking about what we're doing with the community health needs assessment. So there's been a lot of work done. We 
Um, when I say we, this is the BHN and its Behavioral Now group, which is primarily the Adamus Board, Incut Public Health, and uh, BVHS working on what we need to do to develop the CHIP, the Community Health Improvement Plan. Just as a <clears throat> overview, so the survey was done. Um, we had 550 individuals from the community, different walks, adults. Um, some of those came <clears throat> also from agencies about what was needed in the community. And then those go in to help define the CHIP. One of the things Kareem and I have spent some time is trying to get all of the different parties that are involved in community improvement together. So on the right, CCE is the Committee for Civic Engagement. So that would be the university and Kareem sits on that along. <clears throat> Myron is on that from the hospital. Um, that's the group that um, I would say are in charge of, maybe that's not the best term, but but have the collaboratives that were started. And I listed those collaboratives, which are my terminology. Those are the social determinants of health that that and we, we've talked about that before from a standpoint of someone's health, their physical, mental, spiritual well-being. Health care takes care of about 20 percent of that. Um, the other 80 percent are related to really those kind of things. Do you have good housing? Do you have transportation? What's your nutrition? Uh, and especially what's your income level as to what happens? So we've been trying to get the groups together and Kareem and I met last week with those collaboratives. Each one of those has their own task force that works with that and that group meets every other month to talk about problems. One of the, and, and in any community, one of the real difficulties is try, it's not trying to get everyone together, just trying to align what you're doing and to know what the other one's doing for referrals. I mean, I can give you all kinds of anecdotal. Laura had one yesterday. How do we get somebody transported to do something? Um, it was inter That was an interesting meeting for me without going into detail. I learned a lot about, there's lots of groups out there that are doing things. So one of the things that we talked to them about is that we would all be in the same place would be healthy now from a standpoint of just sitting down and talking and <clears throat> i think everybody was agree i'd agreed on that and we're going to get back together in a couple months again to talk about some of those things how can we work together the reason i checked transportation and nutrition there were 10 things that came out of the community of of our chip and one of those was transportation when it's non-medical and another was nutrition uh, related, especially to kids. Now, we don't have the final draft. If you wanna say something about that, we're still waiting to get it back. We were gonna hand that out today. So I've summarized that and we've got a couple other things we can talk about, but they, when I say that nutrition brought this back, they sat at our meeting to develop the chip and wanted that put on. And so we invited them to be on our committee, which again, I think I think it's gonna work out pretty well. So with the Be Healthy Now, below that, those three groups I talked about, those were the issues, and I didn't really put them underneath uh, who they directly are gonna be responsible about, but those were the high level. Uh, we, now I'm gonna be BVHS for a minute. We will be looking and taking responsibility for looking at tobacco with public health. Uh, what can we do? This was specifically asking about adults that don't have income to be able to get tobacco cessation. And there's already there are already plans and things out there. It's how do we coordinate this? How do we find them? So where will it take the hospital? Well, maybe we can screen. Everybody comes in the emergency room. Anybody that is smoking and we make them a referral. All of these will be task forces developed to come up with some plans. Um, the diabetes, Laura is gonna talk about, we get some really exciting results from that that's been being done with public health. Kareem's already mentioned that. And then and in the emergency room, uh, there's a letter, that letter is gonna be approved you that the one from to, uh, Commissioner Peppel, Yes, I'm going to talk about it. So we will talk about that. There's a heightened awareness, concern, 
about what's going on with addiction in the community from all kinds of standpoints, safety, uh, deaths, overdoses, things Gary's working on, the cost, are we making improvement? Um, we, we, we'll talk about that later. But one of the things from the emergency room is, is prescribing best practice Suboxone and making sure that you have handoffs so someone can take care of the person. I think I may have mentioned that last month. Uh, what came up uh, about anywhere you go, the mobile clinic is one that comes up a question about what, what, how, and how can, let's say, with uh, behavioral health, with mental health, how can we reach those people? And that's certainly a project that's being worked on here. Uh, the availability, and again, Laura can talk about yesterday. We just trying to connect people to where what they need to have. And then under the Adamus board, uh, concern about getting uh, individuals navigated into the right system. Uh, this one you get into talking about your navigators themselves, also get Medicaid, et cetera. Uh, Gary Bright has the suicide and overdose task force that we have put together to look post and see what the problems were, what could we have done, the ACEs, the all of the preventions that might have been done. There's going to be a lot of emphasize that. And then one uh, we used is our guiding principles in this. What's what can we do to prevent things? What can we do to improve wellness and concentrating on youth? Uh, the other thing that I just circled up there is workforce. There is a task force <clears throat> that is working across the community, and this is related specifically to healthcare. Adamus Board Jobs and Family Services is is yeah. heading at about we all need help. Um, and trying how can we recruit, how can we retain in Hancock County individuals that are going through Millstream, uh, Owens University, what kind of things we need to do. So that's one of also the things that are on the chip about how do we improve situation related to healthcare. So I will stop there. I, I do know it's on to talk about the opioid later and some of those things, but see what kind of feedback a uh, requirement is that, and I don't, I don't know here what has to be approved by the board. At the hospital, it has to have board approval. You have to do a service in three years and say what we're going to do on some. If there's a needed and a most, just how you. No, I think that. at this point, like Dr. Pro said, we um, we don't have the final draft yet. Uh, I did make you a copy of uh, not the whole report. I mean, it's like you know, 50 pages. I just made you copies of some of the priorities that we want to work on, some of the strategies we have, some of the initiatives, um, and that's been a work in progress since October. Um, it's very hard to get that group together and get to agree on on, on certain priorities, <laughs> but but we did, um, and I think we are we made great progress. We we captured all the feedback, we captured all the needs that are in the community. And um, it's going to be a reflection of that report. Uh, from a, a board of health standpoint, we'll bring the final report to you guys, and uh, you'll adopt it. That's that's what we've done in previous uh, cycles. We'll adopt this being our our priorities and our strategy for the next three years. Um, so I'm, we're hoping that hopefully in January we'll get the final report to all of you, and it will be in a final form. Um, but this is uh, what I made you a copy of is pretty close to where we at with this process. If you want to. Uh, read it slow and give me some feedback later, you know, whether it's call or email um, and, um, and you know, if you have more ideas. But all those strategies, all those priorities were based on the survey we've done last, last uh, fall. Um, so it's, uh, we're, you know, we're back this by the, by the data. That's what, that's what the needs are and that's what we're going to be working on. Yeah, I think any anytime you do something in the community, there's some things that are just, they're inherent. And what this kind of work is, um, way I look at it, uh, I mean, e even you take the collaborative. Everybody has a daytime job, so this is all volunteer getting together. So prioritizing is really difficult. My priority is not meant necessarily what Robin's priority is. And so if you're doing it in the community, and that's as Kareem said, we've spent spent some time trying to come up with something because if you don't prioritize, you're not going to get anything done. The second thing is Kareem has, we're going to get a scorecard. We're going to get a score that that came out from the collaboratives. We need to be able to show what we are doing for lots of reasons. Um, and so I think we're going to be able to develop something that we can bring back. Showing that 
at these normal meetings. This is where we are in the process, not not just public health, but everyone in the community. I think I think that's really important. So, yeah, I think this is promising this cycle, um, although I mean that the whole survey happened during COVID and it wasn't the perfect data collection that we, you know, we've done in the past. But I think we made the best out of it here moving forward and kind of emerging from the pandemic. Um, and we, we have a lot of better ideas for the next survey coming in three years. Um, you know, doing um, continuous uh, continuous collection data, we done not wait until three years and kind of try to survey the population, do more focus groups, stuff like that. Um, I just want to uh, bring your attention to a very important part of this plan, which is um, working on a on a community navigator. I know the hospital has some um, health navigators, but um, the need for community navigators is, is more than ever right now, especially if we're out in the mobile and we're seeing a lot of you know social issues, a lot of things that needs to be taken care of, not necessarily by our provider on the mobile. Um, but by other partners and the resources that are available is just connecting the dots here. Um, I think we need and the committee that we were meeting with, you know, all along here since October, they kind of agreed we need a navigator that do just more more than just health and connecting, you know, people with insurance and connecting with doctors. Um, they need to do more. You know, we have a lot of people in need of, of other services um, that uh, that we won't be doing any good by just giving them the medical attention. They will need that support, that 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 social determinants that we talk about. Housing is an issue. Um, you know, they they might need um, help getting uh, uh, you know a driver license. They, uh, there's a lot of you know to get a good job, to get all those issues. We need to work on part of a bigger plan. And I think our meeting with the co with the different coalitions here was really helpful because. We put them in the frame of mind that okay, well, this is this is the plan from you know from a health assessment standpoint, but all those social determinants, that's all of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, that 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 kind of um, that's kind of it's going to do more. It's going to serve the community a little better by all those coalitions working on that issue. Uh, not only you know the health department, the hospital, and Adams board, but it's beyond. Um, actually, if you if you read through the initiatives, there's one initiative that um, that the transportation is, is, is another one. Uh, and the, uh, food security coalition is leading too. So we try to involve as many people as possible, just based on the data we gathered back in in, in the fall. But nonetheless, they all have. Um, their own in that, and I think they acknowledged that, and and they agreed with our presentation that day. So, um, I think we're on a good track, and hopefully we can make a difference. We want to show it. We want to show the difference. The scorecard, um, anything to go back to the funders, to the public, to people who were behind this project, uh, to show them that we are making progress on those initiatives. I think it's important as well. Uh, the difficulty we had in previous cycles is. Like Dr. Co said, everybody's busy. Um, they all have different boards. They have different priorities. Uh, I, I think it's time to align all those missions and kind of uh, move towards a kind of unified goal, which is that plan. And I think the most important part of it as well, which kind of help us in that uh, achieving that, um, is most of the funders in town. Um, are behind that plan. You know, the Community Foundation, the United Way, um, everybody's kind of behind this saying, okay, you know what? If you want to bring it, um, mm -hmm. if you want to apply for um, for money through us, this is going to align with this plan. If it's not aligned with this plan, one way or another, whether it's housing or, or nutrition or whatever, if it doesn't serve that plan, chances are not as good as if you are working with each other. I think this is great. Do you see the role of the community navigator as mainly helping those clients who need the help, sending them in the right direction? Or do you also see that expanding so that I, I, you know, I see a lot of the faith communities doing different things, you know, like lunches and um, making blankets or, you know, things like that. Pulling them into it also or just connecting the clients? I, I think that the one person and I don't know we have to find the resources for that one mm -hmm. person to, to be able to you know come on board one person cannot do that alone they're gonna have to have a network of faith-based mm -hmm. you know of nonprofits. every you know they have to have that network otherwise it would be very hard to do those connections but yeah uh, that person is is gonna be the not the owner but the keeper uh, and 
the person who maintained that plan um, and accordingly go back to the have you know good networking with all the agencies involved mm -hmm. and say okay you know what um i have connections at housing if we have a housing issue how can we resolve that mm -hmm. i have connections at transportation i have connections at the hospital at the health department so that person it, it's it they kind of have a you know a hand in, in almost every every aspect of social determinants here it would be nice for collaboration because i feel like yes. we're all doing so many good things in yeah. the community but how can we i think they're better and a lot Go ahead, Bill. Well, I was just going to uh, take off on uh, Karen's question here about navigation. Is that the responsibility of the Adamus board or us or whose budget will the navigator come out of? I guess that's the question. Well, I think that's a let me let me just say that's a that's a it's, they're both really good questions. I think the way we will try to approach this is well, where are preferred best practices. I mean, where has somebody, there's a lot of work been done with what are com called community health workers. So they, you really don't have to have a social work or a nursing or a doctor's degree to be able to connect these, mm -hmm. to connect people. It can get, as Bill said, can get really expensive as to what you do, but your, but your point is, well, again, we used the story Laura had, she needed to get somebody transported back to Kentucky. So who do you call? Mm -hmm. Another, I know it's anecdotal, but while Kareem, when we were at this collaborative, we were talking about housing, we started talking, everybody says we need navigators. So first we've got to define what a navigator right. is. Mm -hmm. um, our social work department, our, our transitions of care, that's who I usually call because Anita knows, well, you can call yeah. this person and they'll be able, but there isn't anything formal when we were talking at the at the housing, I think it was housing. We were talking. She has four navigators. I had no idea that I housing no idea that but they would have four be... navigators. And I said, "Well, what do they do?" She said, "Well, here's an example. We got a call from one of your general surgeons saying if you don't get this lady in housing, she's going to lose her other leg. She had an amputation." And so, but the process was, I said, "Well, how did he know?" to call you to do something while we go to church together that's the way that's the way networks are set up it's who you know so that you and so i hope we can get it a little bit more formalized i'm going to use anita bishop is our uh head of social work at the hospital and she said she'd love to get a group together to sit down and, and then i think this is where the front line saying this is the way i would set something up to come back and then to say to what your aunt Bill is, well, we need to get a formalized. I think that wasn't, it's been a while ago, that 211 number, wasn't there right. an attempt right. by United mm -hmm. Way to do something like that? So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, so I, I don't have an answer, mm -hmm. but it would really help. And I think the definition is going to incorporate that you have to follow somebody. Mm -hmm. You can't just make a phone call pass them off to the next person mm -hmm. that you come up okay somebody's going to be and we do need to get the churches and things so yeah. yeah i think the need came about too from discussions again especially when the mobile start going out too too much um you know um we are a lot of times our staff is playing that role of navigation more more than what you know they're there to do uh, i mean laura spent most of her day yesterday trying to coordinate that that Kind of social issue more than medical issue, uh, but but she couldn't let go either because there's nobody to hand it off to. So um, so I think she did a great job handling that. But for better use of Laura's time and and our medical staff time, um, I, I think would the community would be better served with somebody that's connecting the dots all the time. I, I think we really need to raise the awareness because I've been a volunteer parish nurse to a small church out in the county. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I've been asked to uh, give information on. You know, what are those resources? People are stopping by, they want help. And if I don't know what those resources are, so if we can raise awareness, right. there's probably more navig volunteer navigators out there than we're aware of. That's a great sure. point. Yeah. That, and, mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. from the faith-based in yes. this community. Yes. There's a lot of, and, and might even be interested if they're not doing now to volunteer, if they knew what, Back to what's the job description? <laughs> what am I? What am I doing? It's just you know, it's cool here. So it's 
which is understandable. I think this is what this plan is going to give us as a starting point. Sure. To look into what what exactly the role, where they're going to be housed, who's mm -hmm. going to be responsible for that, how we're going to pay for it. So that's that's most of the you know first half of next year we're gonna we're gonna be discussing right. that that issue and starting the program. So I think this is this is on the right track. Yeah. Um, it's a work in progress. So so we'll go from there. The other question I had is, uh, and I'm jumping ahead on the agenda here a little bit. Uh, there's a uh, no uh, drug overdose deaths increase, and I was mentioned uh, that Gary, I don't is whose whose job is that? Is that Adamus? Is that uh, public health? Do you want to? Maybe I can like cream yeah. of how Gary not got involved in that. Adamus is highly involved in that um, task force that looks at every death that is related to overdoses. Okay. We decided to put it together with suicides because it's the same same group and that, that has the fire department, police, uh, the hospitals on public health looking at that. But the direct question, I think, do well, you want to talk about that now? Yeah, we'll to the Adamus board. Is the question about, came up. Uh, you want to summarize what yeah. Commissioner Peppel? Um, sure. I'm, I'm going to start from uh, where, where, what started this whole thing is um, we had a, what we do here at the Health Department, what Gary and his team um, does, we do issue alerts on spike and overdose death. Every time we set up, we set up a threshold, you know, every time we have more than two or three and 24 hours, they will, that alert will go out. Go out to law enforcement, go out to, to um, the judges, go out to the college to be, the mayor, the commissioners, uh, go out to the hospital. We'll go out to all the partners. So what happened last week, um, we had uh, we had four in less than seven days. So that's a big spike. Um, so we issued that alert again, um, and then we were issuing an alert the, the week before. So it's it looked it looked like it's increasing, you know, drug overdose death, it's increasing. So uh, we issue that alert again uh, because we had four death. It's it's unusual for us to have two in a week. Now we had four and in, in less than that's highly highly unusual. So there's some going. Before we go down to go to the root cause and you know do all the 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 you know the the analyzing. Um, this alert is where well, we do this to just to trigger a response um, on all those agencies, EMS, fire, okay, uh, police, be careful. There's some going on here in town. It's highly unusual. We had for that. So um, that kind of um, got some, uh, you know, uh, the commissioners to uh, to call and ask questions of what are we doing about it? How can we do it a little better? So just to work and we've been working with them, but I think it was again highly unusual event that that it happened all uh, all in one week that um, that response was needed. Um, so a couple of days ago, I, I talked to Prasha from the Adams board and said, okay, you know what? Beyond the spike that we do, and a lot of people have questions, how about we put something with specific action items in a letter, a joint letter that we send out, um, and uh, we'll have specific action on how to kind of. Uh, uh, mitigate that increase or that uptick in. Um, and that's the letter I'm proposing. I didn't send it out yet. I want your blessings and, and make sure you guys are okay with the contents. Um, this is going out to the same people that we send the spike alerts to. Um, and um, it's going to be a joint letter because a lot of those issues we came up with uh, with Adams on them. Um, we, we deal with the Narcan distribution mostly. And that's why we're involved at the level of it. Uh, Narcan is a life-saving um, uh, race in this whole uh, overdose, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing. And that's why we're going to, we, we want to kind of not take the lead and we're both working on it. It's just that that's what it's at. It's us that we're distributing Narcan. And um, there's certain items that um, we've been working on for years. We bring them here to the board meeting almost every month. Um, and um, this letter addressed those items that we need to do this to lower the, the overdose. That's those are the specific steps we are um, we are uh, we are doing. Um, part of the ask is for the for the hospital as well, the, the emergency department to to kind of um, 
pick of those recommendations, do them all, do part of them, whatever works for each and every agency and each and every organization. But I think just the responsible thing for, for us to do is to put out what, okay, we, we have a spike in overdose death. We're not going to just sit and send emails. What are the action steps we can do? What is the community can do as a response. And it's not the health department alone or the Adams board alone or the hospital alone. It's everybody on that list that can do something to, to lower that, um, that incident. Um, that's, the, that's the story behind this letter. Um, I did run it a little bit um, by, um, by Brian. Um, he didn't seem to have an objection, but he would like to bring it to all of you to see if you guys are okay with me saying and join this joint letter this afternoon to all the people being done that. So, um, I guess I'd like to add something to this. Some of you, some of you know, some of you don't. My brother overdosed and died nine years ago on his 44th birthday. Mm -hmm. um, heroin with fentanyl and morphine. He was the first of in the teens deaths in a 30 mile radius in a couple of different counties from more or less the same bad batch of whatever. So People that are using typically, from my experience, they end up using more and more and more. The problem is, you know, the supplier, let's say, as an example, is somebody coming in from Mexico, Dr. Coase, and hands it off to you, and you cut it, and you cut it, and you cut it, and you cut it, and they eventually get the ninth cut, and they get used to the ninth cut. But it's an incredibly lucrative business to the sellers. Some of them get more efficient. Some of them bring the stuff directly here, cut it two times, and all of a sudden you get to you a really, really hot dose. And today you want to use more because it hasn't been working so great and you immediately die. Like some of these are hot, hot, and you're two cuts closer. And quite frankly, the people cutting these things and busting them down may or may not be the smartest people and who knows what's in them. And how consistent their cuts are and how well they mix the things together that people are shooting up. Um, that part of the math problem for me is lacking in all of the info that goes out because you don't know, there's no label. <laughs> you don't know who made it. You don't know if all of a sudden your dealer has a new supplier that's three cuts closer to anything you've ever taken before. And you don't know how hot the dose is you're taking. Where would fentanyl strips fit in? Fentanyl strips, from from my experience, you guys have to tell more. I've seen them used a few times by some people just testing them. Um, it can tell you if it's in there or not, but not necessarily how much, right? Because you, you don't know how they work. I, I, I you don't know whether it. anybody uses them. Yeah, yeah, and and fentanyl strips, you know, are very helpful in finding out if somebody's laced with fentanyl. Um, a lot of times that, you know, uh, people don't know what they're getting and that's that's why the, the, the reason the reason I we did not mention fentanyl strips in this because um, there's a there's a house bill that's still mm -hmm. going through the, the house uh, to decriminalize the possession of of uh, of test strips um, and an official letter. You know, as your hired professional, I, 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 I will not put something that's still not fully legal right. to be used in, in an official letter. Narcan is fully legal. We should not get any pushback. People should be should be buying into the idea just for the same, you know, yeah. reason that um, uh, that Brian shared with all of us. Um, and I, I think this is the safest way to go about it at, at this point. Um, uh, I'm but, all for the letter. I just somewhere down the road with yeah, we got we got, we got education on this, explaining the uh, math. I agree on the math problem, and, and even if you know there's fentanyl in it or you don't know there's fentanyl in it, you still don't know if it was the first cut of heroin or the tenth. You don't know the potency of what you're going to take. You know, there there isn't a path of how many hands it went through. You know, it's part of the business. Everything's secret. Don't get caught. Um, you know, my brother was a drinker and alcoholic. I mean, I know he could drink 40 beers in a day and walk a straight line. Eventually, you get more and more and more so heroin. And uh, that's what addiction does. You know, I mean, my dad was my dad was an alcoholic, and therefore I'm not. My brother was the opposite. My dad was an alcoholic, therefore I am too. So, what causes that split? You know, it's totally the 
five, six people you surround yourselves with. And there's a whole lot of who you're hanging around that's doing these drugs. But somewhere that math problem needs to be put out there. I, I, th those are those are great points. And um, I think we had a meeting with Commissioner Pepple, um, with Dr. Flaherty. Some of you may know that the consultant Adams we met on Tuesday. And I, I'm going to frame it back to uh, some of you were there last week. Um, we're closer together or what we have more in common than what yeah. we think. Once you get back by a couple of the stigma, the choice, the all of those kind of things that people who want to do something for the community, the health of the community, it is expensive, uh, the ramifications, the families and all that. So uh, I think that's going to raise to a really high level. I mean, we've been working on this for 10, 12 years, but Back to my comment about priority, this may become the priority for the community because it is getting to be a bigger problem. And there's all the kind of things you talked about. Synthetic fentanyl is really cheap to make. It's got an unbelievable therapeutic. I mean, it's a great drug, but you double it, you're dead, you know, and, and it's just small doses. So I think we need to take all of those things in. What do we do about education? Where do you start? Um, all of those kind of things are going to be part of trying to get a consensus at a, a level of what we should be doing in the community. But your point is really well taken. Mm -hmm. So if everybody's OK with this, I will go ahead and um, send this letter this afternoon and um, we'll see what how we can help. The moving forward here. I hope, uh, it's unfortunate this time of year. We always see a little uptick in, in overdose, but um, but that again, it was highly unusual to have four in less than seven weeks. The letter was great, but I think there's a typo in Dr. Um, in Judge Rothstein's name. Oh, oh. that's in the T got switched. Oh, oh, oh. R O T. Okay. Oh. 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 Right. You are the best. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to compete with him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Best proof uh, of your I know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I don't know. Correct that. <laughs> okay. Anything else? No, I think the letter is great. I mean, yes. I think because, because people better than doing it. nothing. I don't think we have the option to do nothing anymore. I agree. To be honest with you, just sending those emails, mm -hmm. people are getting numb to them. Um, mm -hmm. Some elected officials like Commissioner Temple, you know, called me as well, you know, um, and, you know, uh, he's saying, what are we going to do about it? What are we doing about it? How can we can do it better? Um, those are all that's a good discussion. That's healthy saying, OK, you know what? What else can we do? And I think this letter just given specific steps we can deal with immediately until we we look more into those depth and and we have the um, uh, the fatality review committee that we want to establish here soon. Um, this is going to look more into the root cause and and treat it as any other health you know public health problem where we look at the root cause and try to deal with those health that way. Um, uh, speaking of the uh, suicide overdose fatality review committee, this is uh, this became law um, early this year. Um, what, I'm, uh, what I'm working on with, uh, with Cindy Land is taking a resolution to the commissioners um, to establish, to designate the health commissioner to start such a committee. Although we've been, we started working on it way before it became ORC, uh, we still have to go through the official um, uh, designation by the commissioners, county commissioners, to the health department, to the commissioner of health, to start such a uh, such a. Uh, committee and we're hoping that by January we'll get that resolution passed by them and um, we'll continue to work. That's what I want to say about this subject. Does Before your I yeah does your letter part uh, on the back uh, be worth all police where that stated that's been a bit of pet peeve of mine. Uh, I'm not sure all law enforcement even carry Narcan. Yeah, some of them do carry it. Um, we want to make sure that. Um, but I think it's good to put chair. it out the, there. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think the way this approach, Bill, and I think that's a good point. Not everybody agrees with everything that's on here. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what Commissioner Peppel asked, and I think I think he was right. What are best practices? What we can do? Mm -hmm. There's lots of other practices that probably wouldn't be accepted everywhere, 
about where people, how it's distributed, where you use it. And uh, we got to define our objectives and what we want to do. But I think this is best practice if our goal is to reduce overdose deaths. Mm -hmm. These things work. They've been proven. Um, so that would be the message. Mm -hmm. And we're probably all going to have to keep sitting down and try to come to some commonality. I think it could be a safety issue for the police also. I just saw in the news this week uh, a young police officer, I think it was in Columbus, mm -hmm. was exposed to fentanyl from a scene that she was called to, and they showed a picture of her, and she was really mm -hmm. struggling to survive. And if, if you don't have Narcan on your police car, you wouldn't be able to save yourself. You wouldn't be able to save your life, yeah, as a police officer. It doesn't take very much. No. That was pretty graphic. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Three doses of Narcan to revive her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get it? Wow. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. wow. She was, That's a lot. She was in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it was all accidental. I mean, she had no idea what she's just a routine traffic stop. Yeah. And back to Brian's point, the person that may have been using it wasn't having any trouble with that at all. I mean, the, the yeah. tolerance oh, yeah. builds up. And so she would not. Yeah. She would be resistant. <laughs> That's all I have. All right. All right. Thank so we want to go out of order here and approve this letter. Uh, Wait I don't know. I, I don't know. 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 I don't all right. Um, or do you have anything else, Dr. Rose? No, thank you. Where are we at? 3.3. We'll vote on that when we get through. Uh, okay, no problem. Then we'll uh, we'll do mobile health clinic. Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. All right, go. <laughs> so I included in my report that you guys all received earlier this week just kind of what the mobile health clinic was doing the last month, um, going out to the University of Finley, joining up with the Sir Optimus group to do a health fair. Um, so that was successful, going out to the city mission still, doing going out to Hope House uh, once a month as well. Um, kind of on the horizon for the mobile health clinic, just working on doing these priority needs, um, getting the mobile health clinic really involved and integrated into those plans. So that's kind of a brief synopsis. Um, going on is the Dexcom study, so I included a graph. So on the y-axis, you have your A1Cs. On the x-axis, you have our um, patients, um, which kind of just numbered um, down there. And so this is kind of the graph of how everything looks. So the blue line is where the A1Cs start. The orange line is actually the three-month follow-up. And a little bitty green in there is the start, start of the six-month follow-up. So all in totality, um, average decrease of the patients who have followed up for their three-month follow-up, we've been seeing an A1C a decrease of 2.4%, uh, a weight decrease of 1.9 pounds. Um, six months, we've been seeing an average decrease in total from start to six-month follow-up of 3.2% decrease. Um, the average weight uh, change for six months, though, is kind of a little bit odd. So we've had a total of five patients come in for their five-month follow-up, Two of them have lost anywhere between 10 and 16 pounds. Three of them have gained anywhere from 10 to 25 pounds. So, oh my goodness. Makes sense. So once we throw some more patients into the mix, I think that's a better kind of number for that. And I think those two 25 pounds, I think that's a little aberrant. So yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that's kind of what's going on with Dexcom. And um, on my way of you know making my list and checking it twice, I've noticed that I accidentally calculated those total of hours um, a little bit off. So actually, it's 314 hours. So, so yeah, that's a little bit of. So I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. I want to. I want to tell you how important this is. So one of this, it it's really a drop. Uh, it's not percentage, but percentage is fine. But it dropped from 9.4 to 7. Okay, so that yeah. that number. Now, what what does a number like that, if it's sustainable, mean? Um, I talked to my ex, my partner Lee Schroeder. Just what what do you tell people when you drop your hemoglobin A1C by one point? You live 10 years longer. Okay, so if that's sustainable, just think about this. This is 2.4 that it went down. What's it mean to morbidity? Well, there aren't any real great data morbidity, but we know that if you get your hemoglobin A1C down or your 
your diabetes better controlled. You're not going to have the eye problems, the kidney problems, all of the complications of having diabetes. And then the other thing is, this is to the insurance companies. This is one of the reasons Tom was doing this, that the hemoglobin A1C drop of one means about $1,000 to $1,500 a year reduction in expenses. I think that's probably minimal, and so did Lee, but that's that's kind of the data. There's not great data. It's how do you figure that out? That's a really, really big deal. Mm-hmm. I would also say the people that gained weight, um, those if, you, if you've ever taken care of a diabetic, it's really bad. They lose weight because all that sugar is going out in their urine, and they they really do lose weight. So once you get them better controlled, their weight will go back up because the sugar that is being expended. Now, that doesn't mean they, they may be still way overweight. And, you know, and then also, whatever. you know, I really think that a lot of this too, patients are becoming more compliant with their medications. So, mm-hmm. you know, you start being more compliant with your insulin, you start being more compliant with your sulfonylureas, those medications all make your weight go up. So yeah. I think that that's in there. And mm-hmm. also we're seeing all these respiratory problems. Everybody's getting on steroids. So that's going to affect mm-hmm. this. Sure. But at least we're doing mm-hmm. a year study. So in mm-hmm. totality, you know, in the summer, you're using less steroids than in the winter months when you're going through all these respiratory problems. So, yeah. So And, and in general, the people I've talked to, well, you're talking to all of them, but is they're amazed. Mm-hmm. That cookie really does make my blood sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and people are really the behavioral theory of you know, when Tom Grace talked is that people are taking care of themselves now. They can look at this and yeah. figure out their medications. It, it, this is really exciting. And I always stuff. remember the uh, so-called or the guy that was in the McDonald's line calling. Yeah. The, mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly the perfect scenario of what's going on. We just had a patient yesterday or two days ago who said, I didn't realize how much pasta raised my blood sugar oh. and how quickly it raised my blood sugar. He's yeah. like, I'll eat a, a bowl of fruit and it will just go up a little bit and kind of stay steady. But if I eat a bowl of pasta, it spikes up crazy mm-hmm. high and then drops crazy low because carbohydrates mm-hmm. are sugar and mm-hmm. they should ex- they go up really fast and they get expended really fast. So what's the deal with, because fruit has sugar in it. Mm-hmm. But it's more natural, Okay. you know, and you know, mm-hmm. if you're eating fruit and then not dumping a whole bunch of sugar on it too. (laughs) You know, it's more natural. Your body knows what to inherently do with it. Um, As opposed to pasta. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so very interesting. And you know, you go out to eat anywhere and you have twice, (laughs) your plate is twice as big as what it really needs to be for a serving size. You know, I think that serving size is a big part in this as well. Mm -hmm. The other question that I had, and this diabetic thing is huge, but um, so this explain the uh, grant submitted to Allen County. Yes, so um, part of the initiative, um, what we're doing with the mobile health clinic is getting involved with doing STI and reproductive health. So um, the ODH has a reproductive health grant. Um, it has a five year cycle. So and unfortunately they're like on going into their second year of that grant cycle. So we can't get an, a, like a, a primary grant, I guess would be a good way to look at it, but we can jump on with another county to get some, utilize some of their grant money. So we're joining up with Allen County, who the ODH reported to me is doing a really great job with their grant. So we joined up with them to get some grant money. So hopefully we'll know by the beginning of the year-ish um, if we're gonna get some of that grant money. Does that obligate the mobile health clinic to go to Allen County? Nope. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nope. It'll all be within our county. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All be within our county. So if we're, you know, utilizing the mobile health clinic to do some of this reproductive health, we're just taking out the mobile health clinic and utilizing it within our county. Okay. So, you know, it's not expending money or gas to go down there or, you know, things like that. But, okay. Yep. So all for our citizens. Cool. Any Thank questions? you. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Okay, I was over to you. I'm Thank sorry. You. Yeah, too sorry. I got a minute and a half. I'm looking <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, just again, I kind of like to point out, uh, we're talking about the harm reduction. We've been talking about that this morning. Um, we're still, I think our Hep C cases, I'm pleasantly surprised and I'm, uh, that we're still below. And I think hopefully, if we don't have a spike this month in December, that we should be again below 100 for third year in a row, which will be awesome. Uh, because again, I think that'll show that we're, especially with the 
the um, harm reduction and concern service program we've got. I think that's that's certainly helping with that. Uh, and we've been talking about the Narcan distribution. We're going to be well over, probably closer to maybe even 3,500 by the end of the calendar year, which will be amazing because, again, you can see where we started in 2018 and where we're at, especially given what we're dealing with. I think we've got about 880 uh, known reversals uh, just this year. Again, that's, that's again, what we know. So what there's probably that number again? 880. Wow. Known reversals, and the way we get that information is is when people come in for the they come in for the the BDIP or certain service program. That question is asked of people, and they get they get the naloxone when they leave. But they also ask, "Do you know of anybody? Have you used it on anyone?" And that is really where we get that information. So it's it's probably a lot higher than than what we have. So they're uh, but they've been extremely busy. I know Sharona and Brittany just got back last yesterday. They went to uh, a day long syringe service, or excuse me, syringe service, suicide and overdose uh, prevention uh, program in Indiana. It was completely 100% paid for by by that that agency, but it was an opportunity for them to network with other other programs and get best practices to bring back here. Brittany's been continued to be involved with uh, a lot of other things, getting signed on to the the ORS program, which it it's what the, I won't give you the acronym, but essentially what it uh, I guess it's right here. He's scrolling through here. This allows us to monitor what prescriptions uh, are being issued by the patients when they're doing the overdose fatality review or anything like that, just to bring in as a, an additional comprehensive approach to find out their history. The, as Kareem already mentioned, we're, we're in the process of getting a combined hybrid team set up for overdose fatality review as well as suicide fatality review because many of the components are the same uh, when, when we're looking at history. So again, we're also going to be in the process of rebranding our uh, our syringe service program from BDEP, which was the formal name uh, that was consistent with uh, ORC, to what's going to be called SafeWorks. Uh, the reason being that it was kind of a cumbersome process through Blanchard Valley or other community partners when they were trying to do referrals to the program. People were like, we don't know what this means, and it, you have to spend five minutes explaining what that program is. So we wanted to try to uh, streamline that. and. Safe works and works that portion of the word people know that are in uh, that are using. They know what works are the clean works, the needles, things of that nature. So we felt that it was uh, a good opportunity and a good time now to transition that to make make that program more aware uh, to other people in the community. Um, health education continue to be busy. Uh, car seats. We've got. Um, also, the CPR is really starting to take off. We've done a lot. Of, I think Jess and Alisa have been doing a lot of the program programs here in house. Also, with doing community CPR, I think we're in the process of working on getting a a fee schedule set up and established. So that'll probably be coming next year, early next year, to get that set up so that we can make sure we're covering our costs and staff time for that. As far as uh, EPI and, and emergency planning, Hannah's been busy with COVID monitoring. Uh, working with Jessica on the dashboard, the MRC volunteers have been continuing to be busy with our clinics as well as the University of Finley. They've been helping out with doing the testing. And then uh, um, uh, Cheryl's been, obviously, you can see with her her uh, report, she's been very busy with all of our, our team members, not just in, in our section, but without the, in, in the entire agency, getting messaging out and also her role with uh, Hancock leadership. She's been involved with that, so it's been uh, been very busy as it always is with our section. But I'm very pleased to see a lot of the the programs that we're being involved in starting to really bear fruit, especially on the harm reduction side. It's really starting to take off. And and I say it unfortunately that we have to have that program, but I'm glad that we we do have it because we're already ahead of the game. I think than a lot of communities that are just starting something like this. And that's all my have my report. Unless there's any questions on. What was in the report? Okay. Thank you. Right, Thank you, Chad. <laughs> it was 94 seconds. Was there? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 if I can do this in 30. Um, my report's pretty straightforward, but just a couple of highlights. So, as you guys saw in the report that was sent out, Alexa Dreyer, our CMH nurse, is leaving us. Um, she's done a fabulous job, but 
we do understand she's really wanting to get back into her clinical hands-on experience. So she's going to the emergency department here in town. Um, Kareem and I have started interviews on that process. So hopefully in the next week or two, we'll have a successful candidate that we will share with you. Um, school nursing, is, Jane has done an awesome job helping me go out and get all those screenings completed and education we've been working with. McComb on you know, a weekly basis of the issue there. So I think all the schools are comfortable and know that we're here and we're available for anything they need. Communicable diseases is pretty status quo. Um, I think one thing that the community, I know Hannah's got a lot of calls on the influenza and the RSV and what the numbers are is to know that as far as influenza and what we gets reported is just that hospitalized influenza and the pediatric deaths. So there's a lot of activity going on out there that we don't necessarily know is that hospitalized. So, um, and then clinic, we've been busy. We're really starting to dive into that ECW and I know leadership, we've been busy with the calls and just getting things set up so that we can roll that out to all staff. So we're excited about that. It is going to be a process, but we're excited once that's up and running. It's been pushed out to mid-February um, as far as our go live date. I think we're probably more comfortable with that date now that they've got the data that's being sent over. So that's probably looking to be more in stone there, and I don't think that's going to be an issue at all for our staff. And then as far as clinic goes, I do think we're starting to close that gap on our end that we're starting to get closer to those numbers that we used to be in previous years. Just still those recommended vaccines that we just need to keep that education going. Our COVID vaccines, I think we saw a huge amount of people on a boost coming in before Thanksgiving and the holidays. So starting to level those off. Going into the new year, we'll start doing our walk-in clinics just on Fridays. Um, and then once we are able to get all those single doses, we'll start incorporating those into just our regular appointments, which will be nice. Um, but right now we do have a lot of vaccine on hand from the multi-dose vials, so we'll make sure and utilize those up first. Otherwise, I don't really have a lot more to report on. I've worked with Laura on that reproductive grant. We've planned ahead of time to have days out and separated so our clinics are empty, you know, not empty, but our rooms are empty so we can have that clinic in there so that we're making sure all of our populations being served in that aspect. So, any questions? Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. I guess one over 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 Good morning, everybody. Um, we had a very busy December in the Help Me Grow department, as we usually do. So we did celebrate Christmas a little bit early. We had a visit from Santa Claus. So we thank the EH staff, Ryan Burks, who always graciously <laughs> agrees to be Santa Claus. Uh -huh. We did offer two different time slots to make sure that all of our families could make the event. So we did a lunchtime, um, 1130 to 1 slot. And then we did an evening slot. They were both really well attended. So we had <laughs> 10 families come around noon and then 20 families come in the evening. Um, we just used the conference room here. So it was really nice. Everybody was familiar with the location. We had an area set up where they could do crafts. They could even set um, their letter for Santa in the mailbox. And then the home visitors wrote the letters back from Santa and scroll up a little bit we made sure every kiddo went home with a christmas book so that fits one of our initiatives of early literacy as well so that's always a fun and exciting event for our families moving forward i'm really happy to report that we're going to be aligning with a lot of those guidelines in the chip so we are going to be looking at hosting a training on hats here in town because we have a lot of families that need to need to utilize that transportation system but don't necessarily know how to call and make an appointment um, once the bus gets to their home how do they get on the bus what do they do with their children do they have car seats so we're looking at hosting a training for that especially for our non-english speaking families um, so that's on the horizon also on the horizon for our groups in january february and march we will have the OSU Extension Office coming out and 
She will be focusing on cooking classes for the families, and she is going to especially focus on foods that they can get through their WIC benefits. Mm -hmm. So things like black beans, yogurt, cereal, what they can do with that monthly allotment that the children will enjoy and that is still nutritious. There will also be um, a safe sleep grant that's going to be available that should be available starting in January and I am going to look at applying with that with community partners to do a baby shower in the spring. So we had a highly successful baby shower in the fall. We're looking at maybe um, targeting some of those moms that are due in the summer months for services. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> Um, our EH numbers for the month of November, they're st status quo with um, where we've been in the last few years. I know it looks like we've not been doing a lot because we got a lot of zeros here, but this is our seasonal programs, so that's going to be normal. Um, our inspection trends were right on target with where we've been here in these last couple years. Um, looks like we're going to probably round out the year right on target, so no concerns there. Um, Heidi, I, I, I think this speaks a lot to the food safety class and us being able to offer it in person. Um, that is the class that Heidi's teaching to anyone that's working in the food service operation. The last two classes, we've actually had 100% passing rate. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said about being able to take a class in person. Both of those groups have been very conversational, a lot of questions back and forth that I think that has helped everybody, even Heidi, because they've given her some good questions we've come back had good dialogue together so i think that just speaks a lot about heidi and that program we're actually going to get ready to the first of the year um share that program again with all of our neighboring counties because there's a lot of job openings in our neighboring counties eh directors are leaving um sanitarians are leaving so i think just having that new staff that's out there letting them know the resources maybe we can you know, help their um, population as well. That vacant EH position, yes, has been posted. Unfortunately, I'm not like Shannon doing interviews yet. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know anybody out there, um, please send them my way. I'd be happy to talk about it. I do know that Kareem had an opportunity to talk to the University of Finley this week, um, Dr. Murphy particularly, and the um, uh, what is that program exactly? The, the occupational health. So I think there might be some opportunities there to where we can go in and provide some education on what this position really is about. And then obviously, as we've spoke before with the BGSU. Um, other than that? I, I've, I've spoken to about eight different sanitarians in other counties and I've been telling them how great this county is. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Them in stores. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm going to this store and hey, the health inspector's here, and I always turn right. And go, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do try to, you know, give them your email. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I just wondered if uh, would Owens be a source of anybody? I'm going to say you need a bachelor. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Craig, I think Craig is not feeling well. Uh, he went home early yesterday and uh, uh, he couldn't make it today. So he's been working a lot. I'm just going to uh, follow up with what Sharon was talking about the um, uh, ECW, which is the electronic medical record about software that we're uh, we bought um that's been a lot of work on that uh craig um shannon and um and dan um our registrar is kind of in charge of billing as well they've been really working hard with the with the team um from the uh, from the software company um, uh, laura was on a lot of those meetings as well to make sure we get what we want um so it's in the uh we're at the stage right now where they're migrating the data from the old system 
Um, and that takes a, uh, takes a little bit of time, a little bit of being careful when we want to bring over and you know what what's kind of what's going to work for the flow of the clinics and stuff like that. So, but they've been working hard. It, it's going to be you know uh, they're going to be even working harder the next couple of weeks here in preparation for hopefully deployment in, in February. Uh, but um, that's uh, that's in a nutshell. Uh, uh, Craig's uh, Craig's report. Any questions about CW or anything else there? Well, they had her behind schedule. It's that deadline for all the updating and combining data. Yeah. Yeah. Are they on schedule. They are. I think we had we, we had a little um, a little snag with the data that that was being imported from the old system. Uh, some of the fields are not are not lined up the way they want them to. But um, but we've been coordinating a lot of those calls between our old um, system administrator at the new system and um, I think they got that sorted out. Um, that's why I think we're kind of on on um, on training the staff and everything else and that's why we think we it would be best to push it to, to February. Um, I think that we, uh, we took into consideration you know the, when the clinics are busy when they you know the end of the month sometimes they do a lot of inventories available. <laughs> Um, some some uh, of Shannon's staff are going to be on on um, some medical leave moving forward too. So we can we're trying to coordinate all that to make sure we maximize the time when that team is here to kind of give us um, it's a gigantic undertaking. That it will is be very very good for us after. But thank them and you know everybody for. Uh, I will I will. But like I said, they they really working hard on it and and um, it's that's what I keep telling them every meeting and you know I tell them you know what once it's all said and done it's going to be really nice. So think about that. Yes. <laughs> now it's the hard work, but uh, but it's going to be really nice when it's uh, all said and done. Okay. As far as. Um, we talk, you know, I talked a lot about the different uh, things I'm working on. Um, the chip being the biggest. Um, I uh, I did attend the Marion Township meeting uh, a couple of days ago. Um, that was very good. I think we're continuing. They were really happy with, uh, you know, with the flu clinics going there from Shannon's team, and um, they were happy with the with the mobile health clinic going and offering um, screenings there. Um, I think. We have we, we we've done a lot with Marion Township, and I think they're looking forward to kind of put more into next year. Um, we uh, that we value that relationship, and then this is our window to the to the whole county kind of uh, because a lot of the smaller townships they don't you know take our offers to come and and do stuff, um, but they do they do kind of talk to each other and then consult with each other what works what the, what doesn't work, and I think this is um, this is a, this is a good start here. Um, I did. Um, I want to update you on a couple issues that we tabled, namely the um, the agreement with uh, Bowling Green State University um, on establishing a teaching health department here at Anchor Public Health. Um, there's not much been done on that because of the holidays uh, yet, so I, I don't have a final agreement to bring to you. Uh, but I did, I did have some conversations with the University of Findlay, namely Dr. Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a professor with the occupational health uh, section or program there. And I talked to him about the work we've done with, with BGSU and how we can replicate that here because of the need for sanitarians. Um, I think he he agreed and I, you know, I talked to him about you know, those are building blocks. I mean, a lot of the courses you have already in your program, but just have we have to add maybe a couple more to just make it a you know a degree. Um, so he agreed and he said, well, early next you know January we'll start talking about that and see how we can um, we can we can um, you know do some uh, some that will be helpful. I told him in the meantime, I'm offering my staff here to uh, from environmental to come and talk to your class. Um, because um, there's value in kind of telling your class what are what options they have to. It's you know it's uh, we do have big you know with their degree they're very well qualified to be sanitarians as well. Um, so um, so I think uh, we're gonna start that too in the next semester here starting in January as well, uh, where I offered um, um, you know Lindsay and Kurt to go and talk to students, have them come in here and chat for a few days. Anything that we can get that young generation that's graduating 
interested in public health in general and particularly in, in environmental health because we're having the biggest um, this problem filling those positions. So we're working on, on different fronts here, but this is all uh, hopefully it will, it's going to pay off you know, soon and, and, and get us into a better place as far as the staffing. Um, any any particular question for me? I think uh, most most of the leadership talked about what they're involved in, and, and uh, you know, I'm uh, working with all of them on all those issues as well. Um, we can move into um, some new business personnel. Uh, Shannon did mention that Alexa Flyer uh, did um, end her resignation, and her last day was um, yesterday. Um, she did like it working here very well. It's that's that CMH program, like Shannon explained a little bit. It's more of a, an advocate type. It's just social work a little bit, not too much hands on, um, you know, nursing. And she want to kind of try to get back to that, and which we we very well respect uh, for as much as we want her to to stay and we want to retain her in that position, especially with the with the huge work that. She's done with the health of Shannon in the last few months here, emerging from the pandemic and bringing all that um, uh, that uh, that case management back up. Um, it's going to be kind of a tougher position to fill because this is a very specialized. There's a lot of training involved, a lot of you know um, onboarding. Uh, but I think uh, we're in the frame of mind, right, Shannon, that uh, we're going to do it again, and uh, we'll, uh, she's ready to. We're ready to kind of offer the job to a um, couple of the people we've seen this week or last week. We might have a couple more to see and interview, um, but um, but we'll provide them with the proper tools and hopefully we'll get a good match. That's where we're at with this one. We did talk about the drug overdose um, increase and um, the joint letter to be sent uh, to be sent out to um, officials in town and um, um, Brian did suggest that um, if you guys are okay with it, we uh, we vote uh, to just and I give your blessings to uh, what's in the letter. Uh, since again, you might you're out and about in the community, you might be hearing about some of those issues, and uh, I, I want to make sure you know where, what we send out and then in your name there. Um, so Any more comments on the letter. Anybody seen another spell page? <laughs> So I guess I would ask for a motion to approve the letter with the one name changed yes. without it and verify the other name just to make sure. Um, do we have a motion to so move? Second. With with the changes, right? Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. And um, I think keep moving down the agenda here. Uh, we did talk about the uh, establishing the teaching health department. Um, we did talk about the community health improvement plan. Um, and uh, I think our last item in new business is um, to, um, uh, with our guest here, Mr. Lewis. I think it's, uh, I'm sure it should be arriving here soon. It's almost nine o'clock. Um, we want to move out of um, out of order a little bit and talk about the meetings for next year. If you go to item 6.0, um, our next meeting is on January 20th um, at 7.30 right here. Um, 7.2, um, this is our regular board hall meeting for, um, for 2023. Um, if everybody's okay with this, still keeping it on the third Friday at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, those will be the dates next year, uh, so you can mark your calendars. And um, we did verify that once and twice here by Cheryl and uh, and Lindsay uh, to make sure it's not falling on a holiday or um, close to a holiday that might not be with the business of the board. So, unless you guys want to change what we've been doing here for a while into next year, change the time or or or. Um, the time of the day or the Friday or make it a different day, um, that would be the right time to do it right now. Um, otherwise, everybody's okay. That's um, that's the schedule for next year. I texted you one date that I'm going to be out of town. Okay. And that's kind of to be expected. I, I mean, 
you know, um, we do really appreciate you guys being here month after month and kind of dealing with the business of the board. Um, it's been a really good year. It's been really good about seven years now. That's good. Um, so, um, so we want to continue that run. I really appreciate your service on the board. This is. Um, you guys have been great uh, uh, advice and consent for not only myself, but a lot of leadership who you know, I'll reach out to you. Our guest. <laughs> hey. Oh, hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, Lewis. Well, hello, everyone. Hi. Myron, please have a seat. Yes. And Merry Christmas to you, and uh, thank you for visiting today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, and I told the board earlier, um, we put you on the agenda, and I had to say that uh, since you came to county, we wanted to come to public health and kind of visit with staff and, and kind of see how we're structured and how we can work better together. Um, I really appreciated that. Back then, it was COVID all over, and it was up and down, <laughs> and we couldn't do it. Um, but I think today is a, is a good day, and um, um, welcome to our Board of Health, and welcome to the Health Department. Behind you is our leadership staff. Hello. Um, Hello. So, um, so I don't know where do you want to start. Do you want to start by introductions here, or? <coughs> That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Very good. Karen? You know me. Yes, Karen, how are you? you? Nice to see you. <laughs> Robin Spores. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I haven't seen you since <laughs> last night. <laughs> Or a text this morning. <laughs> Bill Altry. Bill. Nancy Moody Russo. Nancy. Mike Linda Mood. Mike, nice to meet you. Brian Great. Edler on the restaurant. On the board. And the president of our board. <laughs> and the president. <laughs> Very good. I, I'm going to have leadership introduce themselves. And if you talk a little bit about your program, so we can give Myron a little idea what, what we do. So do you want to start? Sure. My name is Alexa Haycock. I am the program manager for Help Me Grow. So we work with low income pregnant moms and families with children up to the age of three. Mm -hmm. We do visits within their home, help connect them to resources, um, complete developmental screenings on the children. And the children. And we've got about four to five programs underneath me. So we're our vaccines, immunization program, our school nursing, communicable diseases. We work some of the nurses within Help Me Grow as well. And of course, COVID is not good. What's that? And of course, COVID, COVID as well. Yeah. COVID. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chad Masters. I'm the director of health promotion and planning services. So we have kind of a have a cornucopia of, of services that we offer there. Uh, we've got a harm reduction uh, that deals with the syringe service, naloxone, distribution. Um, uh, we have some peer supports that work in that program. So we have a couple individuals who have lived experience, which really helps promote our program. We also have a overdose fatality review uh, coordinator who assists with that. And we also have a epidemiologist slash emergency planner. So they do a lot of the uh, disease surveillance, heavy COVID, obviously during that time, but other outbreaks, things like that, as well as uh, we have a contract CDC uh, epidemiologist that we've been working with that's helped create our dashboards for COVID as well as infectious diseases. We also have our communication our communication specialist, who you probably met out there, Cheryl Miller. She is, um, she was uh, in addition to us last, last January to help improve our communications. And then we also have a health educator who um, does a lot of uh, community activities within the schools, as well as the car seat program at the hospital and, and just a variety of other things. So we've kind of got a little bit of everything in our section. I'm Laura Reinhardt. I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm over the mobile health clinic, so I'm the provider and the coordinator. Um, so with the mobile health clinic, we're taking it out to the community to provide health care services. And also under my kind of umbrella, we're doing the Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring study. So I'm kind of helping with the health department side of that study. Thank you. I'm Lindsay Summit. I'm the Director of Environmental Health and Assistant Health Commissioner. I um, oversee the section. We're more in the regulatory. We're the ones doing the restaurant inspections, the sewage and water inspections. Are you good friends with her? Oh, uh, <laughs> I know. No conflicts, no conflicts. Uh, we also are monitoring animal bites that come through. So we see a lot of those reports coming out of the ER. We're making sure um, those animals are vaccinated for rabies. Um, 
campground inspections. We do those. We're doing all those festivals and fairs in the summer that you're seeing our staffs out there doing that. Um, what else do we have? There's several things. Mosquito program, we do that in the summer. We bring an intern in to assist with that. Uh, you just never know what environment. <laughs> <laughs> Sure you've seen some interesting things. <laughs> from, from one from my end, I want to give you a little uh, overview on how we're structured as a board of health. Um, we do have a what we call uh, the board of health is appointed by the district advisory council. That's made out of uh, 29 uh, individuals. The mayor is on that council. Um, the commissioner's chair is on that council. And each and every township and village we serve is represented by their chair uh, on that council as well. So um, our board of health members are are voted um, in uh, through that PAC council that meets once a year every uh, the first Monday of the month of March, where we present our um, annual report to them and you know uh, give them the status of uh, public health in, in in the county, um, and we'll if there's any. Board member that will need to uh, to go for a vote. They they will uh, they will vote them in, and that's how we start uh, the year. Then um, that board of health is can think of seven individuals. Uh, I think at the at the combination of the city and the county uh, about seven years ago, uh, the agreement was that um, three three individuals on the board will represent the city, three individuals will represent the county. Uh, townships and villages, and one individual will represent one of the programs we license. That's um, that was uh, uh, there. So um, they kept them at seven, so we don't have a tie when they're voting. Um, so that that's been working pretty good. Um, we always, um, you know, um, where um, we were kind of insisting when when that agreement was put together that a representative from the hospital would be on that board as well. And that's how BJ ended up um, on, on that board. And um, uh, she served uh, two terms as president of this board as well. Uh, she's done a great job. Um, so um, that's how our board is structured. They meet once a month and uh, they, they're mostly tasked with oversight, especially uh, fiscal oversight, where we show them the budgets, we show them what we're paying, uh, we'll show them all the details of, from a fiscal standpoint. We'll have all the leaders come into the board meetings as well every month and report on, on their activities for that month. Uh, that will give a chance to our board to, uh, to, to see what's going on programmatically, and they will give them a chance to ask questions. They're all members of, uh, uh, esteemed member of our community and they, you know, they go to places and they see people and they might be, uh, you know, um, asking questions about what, uh, what we're doing. Um, from that end, um, as far as myself, I'm not an elected official. A lot of people thought that I'm an elected official back <laughs> during COVID, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm appointed by the board, um, and um, <laughs> from there I will um, I'll, uh, I will hire staff to to help me carry the the guidance and what the board wants me to do in the district. So that's how we're structured. It's uh, like probably from the introductions you you can tell we're a very diverse group. Um, we have 35 full time uh, employees, um, but very diverse and professional uh, way we have. We have nurses, we have help me grow uh, visitors, we have um, uh, registered sanitarians that will do inspections. Um, we do have social workers on staff. We do have plumbing inspection part of our, uh, our work. Um, so it's a very, even within sections, we are a very diverse group and, and um, but we they work together greatly, especially that I didn't put any windows in this building for them to look out. So they always look for each other. <laughs> That's, so, now that's a strategy. Uh, so, um, so they do really help each other, especially that was really, really apparent during COVID when we had, um, you know, environmental helping with uh, with traffic control registration for the clinics while the nurses were given the shots. Uh, we had everybody, I mean, all hands on deck when when some uh, when we need them. Uh, uh, Chad's section is a great, uh, great service, not only to, to all the agency, but to the community as well. Our epidemiologists put out those reports about COVID and the flu and, uh, and they work on different disease, uh, you know, intervention um, and tracking, which is, you know, one of the essential things we do in public health. Um, I think, uh, and, you know, I speak for all of them. 
you know, since you came to town and you assumed that responsibility, we're always looking forward to kind of working more with the hospital. Uh, you know, we've been working with Dr. Co since the merger, um, you know, uh, but during COVID, I think that that became a little more strong and, and I really do appreciate your vision of us working together um, to make the, the life of our community, you know, a little healthier, a little better. So um, that's my elevator speech. <laughs> How about yours? <laughs> oh, boy. How much time do I have? <laughs> you know, 90 seconds. <laughs> it's not well, so I have start. I started here in January of 2020 on, in the middle when our COVID numbers for the first time hit the, our mm -hmm. highest amount and came into this organization and community. And I came from, I, I'll say West Michigan. And so um, came there, came from there with my wife, Lisa. We have two girls. Um, they're both uh, in college. One's uh, in graduate school, getting her MSW. She finishes in uh, May. And she said, I just signed <laughs> up for uh, April 29th. Last bill being paid on that. <laughs> our other daughter is a junior at Butler, which is a small college over in Indianapolis. So that's the that's the four of us, and, and our, our, we're kind of a uh, happy. We're we're very happy to be here. It's, but it was a very difficult, strange time. For the first fifteen months, was COVID. With COVID, I think I met you in my first week on screen. You know, <laughs> yes, yes. And we talked it on a screen or a background as we were trying to do and, and, and communicate with. And we did that with Dr. Coase. Um, so it's been a very interesting ride from that perspective to try to learn a community in the middle of COVID. I think for the first six months, I would go to a restaurant to eat dinner or something. There's no one there. <laughs> you know, it's just a strange time. But this year, it's really seemed to settle down. This summer seemed to be what I'd say normal, and it's been really nice. For us, it kind of slowed down a little bit in April of this year. And so as we look forward as an organization, our partnership with the community is probably most very important. So it's on our strategic plan partnerships with the community, both clinically and, and, and non-clinically. So how are we helping advance the health of the community? The community health needs assessment is core to that and really want to make sure that we're in alignment with the community. So we're actually making change. <laughs> and I, I have a firm belief that the hospital um, can't change the community. The community has to change the community. So we're a person or a player. We're, we're not the, um, I say owner. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. But we want to participate, and I think Dr. Coase resembles that um, to his bone, salt of the earth down there. <laughs> so I think that that's really important. So since being here, I am now I'm on the board for the Center for Civic Engagement. I'm on the uh, board for the underneath the alliance next week for economic development for the community. And so that'll start in January. And I'm doing doing on some other small committees. Every once in a while, people pull me in. So I'm starting to get being able to get engaged with the community after, again, I say the cloak of COVID. And then, uh, for, so that's kind of a local level. Then at the state level, I'm a member and in, involved with the AHA and our, I'm on a committee for them, the CEO Executive Oversight Committee for the state for healthcare. And this past week, I was asked by the state to be on the behavioral health board for OHA and a task force for the state. So I'll, I'll be joining that in the in the new year as well. It's a new task force focused on that. And then at a national level with AHA, I am just now on a round table for CEOs of independent hospitals around the country. And we just had our first call yesterday. So I'm trying to get engaged at the national level, the state level and the local level and somehow magically all those pieces together. And from a basis, again, from a training standpoint, I started out as a social worker. I'm a master's in social work, and I started out as a clinical therapist. And so that was where my beginning started. And so I started working in hospital when I was young, and I always joke we didn't have any kids, and I think I wanted a motorcycle. And so I, I, uh, I said, well, you have to work more. I, I, so I got I started doing call at a hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which means I just picked up night call and to, and I fell in love with healthcare um, and what we do, what we do and transitioned from to working in a hospital actually as a discharge planner, social worker, case manager, and and I've done a lot of psych admits. Um, and certainly know the world of behavioral health on more than one end of that stick. And so 
then then my career just kind of evolved since then. So I would just really have learned healthcare from the from the ground up, and so which is a little different. Some people don't do that, and but that was my journey and story. It's kind of like it, I had would make a pizza before I owned one, you know. <laughs> but I think that what we do is really really important, um, and I think what community health does is really really important. My oldest daughter works for Arbor Circle in Ottawa County, which has a lot of the programs and services to help families, and she does education for kids and uh, trying to help them and their families progress in, in the journey, because everyone's journey is not the same, as we all know. And I always say you, you can live in a community your whole life, not really understand your community. And there's a lot of needs in this community, so how we can bring them together is a primary focus for me. So that's my 90 seconds. <laughs> I was just going to add uh, Chad oversees and Karen participates in the Medical Reserve Corps, which is a real vital component to this department, I think. The Medical Reserve Corps. Yeah, so yeah. I just. I'll keep it under 90 seconds. So, <laughs> the commercial, yeah. So the Medical Reserve Corps is a national organization. Our unit started in 2008. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do, try to do is we build our infrastructure for emergency responses. So COVID oh, or hand flu, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And we utilize those medical volunteers uh, during to help offset, you know, our staff because we only have so many nurses here, but these individuals can come in and they basically run all of our clinics. Um, they work at the hospital at the early outset, but what we do is we try to recruit um, and during emergencies, it's easier to recruit because everybody wants to help. But then our non-peak time, it's a little bit difficult to maintain that interest. So I know that in years past, I've approached the hospital um, uh, like their HR to say, hey, as part of your onboarding or your intake, um, would it be something you could provide that information to your new employees, mm -hmm. something they might be interested in yeah, participating in their their community so that is something that has been vital uh, it's been a huge economic it made a huge economic impact i mean probably seventy five thousand dollars worth of um, money that you know for time that these volunteers contributed just during the pandemic uh, this pandemic so it's it's huge um, so we we pull anybody from doctors nurses nurse practitioners dentists. Anybody, everybody, dentists yeah but during this time we did we pulled uh, they were able to and veterinarians anybody that is able to assist during an emergency. So, um, yeah, very vital. So thank you, Bill, for bringing that up. All right, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I just want to call out two things. I had, we, the Blanchard Valley, did a Ringer Remembrance video. Did anybody here see that? Yes. A couple? Mm -hmm. um, you did? Yeah. I, that, that. We were trying to figure out a way how to help our team move forward. You know, when you have tragedy, or trauma and COVID really was for our frontline workers. And so, and for here, and, and I mean, you guys, your world flipped upside down for a little bit of time. Um, I, aren't you elected official? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I play one on TV. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I hope you, and I encourage it to be shared around to this group because I think it also represents what you guys had gone through um, as an organization and as a community, um, that is for certain. I had a second thought and I lost it, but it'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to add to um, the MRC volunteers. They were, they were great help. It was, it's, a, it's a great thing to have in our community. And our, our chapter is one of the most active ones in the state. Um, mm -hmm. This is a federal uh, program, so we're in Region 5, is that correct? Mm -hmm. We're one of the uh, you know, uh, most active in, in our region as well, which include Chicago, Illinois, and a couple couple mm -hmm. other places too. Indiana is part of that too. Mm -hmm. So I think we're moving forward. We want to build up on that and and um, uh, and have that that kind of um, uh, resource and the med surge or some if we need some it will be available. Mm -hmm. that, there's an exercise that the hospital is part of um, coming January about. Um, it's a tabletop this time, mm -hmm. and we do those two of those exercises a, day, uh, a year, um, uh, which uh, us and the hospital are, are playing in, 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 in January. Um, it's a simulation of a um, radiation uh, incident here in the county. 
Um, so we're looking forward again. Is the more the more we we plan and the more we we go through the, those plans and try them and see what what's working and what's not. Um, that's uh, the hospital is a big part of that. Um, I always I served in other communities as well. I always consider ourselves here very lucky to have you know one health system uh, because I've, I've seen how uh, dysfunctional those relationships between hospital and public health and the health of the community can become when you have more than one health system involved. Um, so we're not gonna name where, but uh, but but that's that that was really really helpful, really easy um uh, for both entities to kind of communicate with each other it was streamlined it was efficient um and we got things done during covid big time so that's uh, i think that's uh, makes it a little easier yeah, yeah. and and you triggered what my other thought i was going to share is how the hospital work we are not for profit and uh I, people always what does that mean um we give um to the community to support the community about 25 million dollars a year of uncompensated care um, to, to the community. Um, we call it charity care um, or bad debt. That means people don't pay their pay their bill and we end up writing it off. But we also do a lot of community donations and supporting a lot of different programs and services, um, whether it be the, the mobile vehicle here or others, but it's about $25 million a year um, that we give back to this community that a lot of people don't realize or see, um, and we don't go around and, and promote or communicate that, but that allows a lot of people to get health care when they really can't afford it. And so we consider that a service that we do sure. in the community. And the safety, I was touring Whirlpool plan a few months ago, and we talked about, can we do some type of work between them and us and other few employers for a emergency? because we all have to run drills. So I'm very interested in continuing to do that. Absolutely. Well, that's an open discussion. Anybody have a question for Myron? I mean, we have his attention this morning and we appreciate that too. So I thought I was just going to get a tour, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can get a tour as well. Give me the virtual tour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. You know, kind of, I was hearing what you were saying about your your how you started, and and obviously Brian has shared his story and how he started with, you know, learning the business from the ground up as opposed to just coming in and and run the place, and you have no idea what everybody from the ground up does. So I think that that's going to be a huge asset to us, uh, especially public health, to know that's what your background is, and that you actually have other, you know, with being, you know. Uh, Clinical therapist or counselor, um, social work. So you, you have not just administrative uh, background, which I think will be key. So thank you for sharing that, so that we know who we're playing with. <laughs> now, I won't give you all my cards. So that's, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> that's fine. That. <clears throat> Any other discussion points? Anything you want to bring up? I mean. Like from time to time, many of us use your facility more than we want to, and then, mm -hmm. you know, the outcomes have been pretty good. Mm -hmm. How you guys pulled through, how you pulled through the pandemic is, uh, you know, there's some people burning it at both ends, mm -hmm. <laughs> going on and on. Yeah, and we're a little fearful now as we get into winter, as mm -hmm. you saw our number of numbers increase 400% in two weeks for admissions. Mm -hmm. They became primary admissions for COVID, um, not secondary COVID admissions. So I think we're at 12. I don't know what we are today. I didn't, I didn't see today's 12 was 12 yesterday. yesterday. But we had 17 the day before. And so. Uh, you, you know, the one difference, though, is everybody has a much better handle on things now. Mm -hmm. we're, I, mean, I was still working in 2020. Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it, it was a complete. They <laughs> unknown, and, and you sort of hope for the best. What well, never really came, uh, and then you started getting conflicting opinions. Oh, so man. and so saying this, so and so saying that, and now we know people got censored for things that weren't politically correct or what have you. But I think, uh, if anything, we have a b better handle on things, right. uh, and hopefully, people in the community know that. Um, now, I guess one thing I wonder. I was going to bring this up earlier. Are the numbers up because everybody's aware of it and getting tested? Whereas several years ago, nobody cared about getting tested for flu. Yeah, I, I RSV was out there, but you never heard about it. Yeah. 
but certainly the availability of people still have COVID tests, and if they get something, they're more likely to get checked because they feel, and which is true, that there are some things we can do as far as treatment, outpatient or inpatient. And the other point you make, Mike, is we don't have to worry, at least right now, with the supply chain. <clears throat> if you remember back when it first started, everybody was making masks. We weren't. We didn't know what we were dealing with. And just getting all kinds of supplies were issues. Those are not issues now. It's as we talked, Myron, a little bit before. Workforce is uh, an, an issue. We're we're okay now and can take care of people. But I do think there is a uh, one of my concerns is the is somewhat the opposite. Is that I've seen some really sick people. Well, I did a COVID test that was negative, so I must be fine. Well, there's still bacterial pneumonias. There's still other things out there mm -hmm. that you can get, and it just seems well, you either got this or you've got that. But overall, I think it, it that it, that there is more awareness and understanding that there is something that can be done. So, so people are coming in. The individuals who get admitted to the hospital, not that it's real strict criteria, but the criteria <laughs> and things like that of what we can do. Uh, and people are aware of that. People, a lot of people have pulse oxes at home that they're checking themselves and know what to do if they do get sick, especially especially the group that's immunosuppressed. They are very sensitive to this. And, and then the above <laughs> six too. And I think that yesterday at the hospital, we didn't have an open bed, a free bed, open bed. Yeah. We were 100% full. And staff, <laughs> that was because of COVID. I heard you speak a few weeks ago about how many job vacancies <laughs> yeah. there were, are. Who wants to? Yeah, we. So we. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> 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 hey, I got a lot of both ways. <laughs> well, it's, it's, this is not going to change for for the, for the years to come. But we we are the county's largest employer with 3,200 associates. And uh, I used a little, you know, survey question: How many, how many job openings do you think we have? Let's take a guess. Bill, you, you asked the question, so you go ahead and yeah. I know, you know the, the answer. answer. <laughs> oh. He knows the answer. Five hundred, roughly around five hundred. Oh wow! And so there aren't five hundred people in this community <laughs> that are going to fill those jobs. And I know that if I go to any organization in this community, that there's positions. There's literally in this in this county alone um, thousands of open positions, and so there's not thousands of people at those positions. So we're in we're in this as a community for the long haul, um, as we have to navigate forward. So certainly an interesting time. Are the majority of those positions clinical? Would you say or no? We run half and half. Yeah, because I mean, it's like any other mm -hmm. business. I mean, we have accountants and mm -hmm. data analysis, people that do data, and to people that cook and clean the right. floors, to nurses. But um, we're very dependent on travelers. Um, mm -hmm. So if we didn't have, I think, 75 travelers right now. We would have had to discontinue um, <laughs> services. So we have 75 travelers, and this is pretty much. The way it's oh, as a traveler, uh, out of curiosity, uh, means you don't work for us. We contract with some oh, third party okay. country mm -hmm. for you to come to and not stay with us, okay. and we you do a twelve week assignment, and then we. So, so those would be like ten ninety nine employees. Yeah. Well, we pay the company. We pay the company. Company, the company mm -hmm. pays them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't pay them. We pay a company. <laughs> <laughs> Based on our contracts, that that's do. probably expensive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> unsustainable. <laughs> yeah. It's always sort of had you. The majority of those are probably nurses that are. Most there. of those are clinical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are respiratory are therapists. How about radiation? Radiation. radiation uh, yeah, radiation, oncology, respiratory therapists, nurses. Yeah. Yeah, it's it it is just uh, MRI techs. I mean, CT techs uh, just I can be just across the board in anything clinical, non-clinical. So we just don't have enough uh, people. So in a lot of hospitals that you've seen across this state, you've seen a couple hospitals close this year. 
close mm. uh, or consolidate their space or stop programs and services. And it's because they can't staff it. It's because you can't because you can't staff it. So I think all businesses, regardless if you're rolling aluminum mm -hmm. or um, doing in healthcare, we're going to have to adjust the services that we can do to the resources that we have. And in this case, the resources is, I mean, it, it's always a financial resource because you have to keep the lights on. But um, I always think about uh, what is that? It's a Bobo debt. debt. We'll keep the lights on for you. What's that commercial? <laughs> yeah, what's his name? So you always need to have money to keep the lights on, but um, mm -hmm. we're going to have to um, limit services because we don't have the people to provide it. And if you can't provide it really well, you know, you kind of have to do a balance because you need to have that person maybe be somewhere else. So. That's just uh, something that all hospitals are doing across the United States. Mm -hmm. We are no different other than we're doing better than most across the country. I would say we're doing better than most, but it's not a position that we can be in. Overall, in the state of Ohio, the majority of hospitals are um, in the red or losing money. And so they're going to reserves or um, to the bank to keep up. And we see, we see that pretty consistently across the country so just a different time it's like the post-covid we didn't get a break <laughs> <laughs> and neither did anybody else you know with inflation so the employers are feeling the same pressures so we'll get through it you know as as we always have in the past and always will in the future yeah any other comments or discussion point for I'm just curious who, you know, you didn't hear. Oh, 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 the famous Leo. I mean, I've seen you on, on you know, presenting, but yeah. I've, um, this is my first board meeting that I've been to, so it's so nice. I don't know if it's still dark outside. It's kind of funny, like, getting in here. Um, Leah is with the courier. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we just met yesterday. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm doing like a funny, not funny, but like a fun little holiday story so it's i get your message <laughs> yeah so whenever you yes thank you yeah i think the courier has been a great partner here especially during covid um you know what um with sarah and now leah um you know continuing that um you know and pushing the messaging out to the public and kind of keep every you know their readers informed so um they're always invited to our board meetings you know maybe they'll pick up a story of interest to their to their readers and they will uh, you know will provide them the information to present it that way so uh we try to be uh, you know um now we try to think we have to and we've been um, as transparent as possible um all our meetings are recorded and live streamed as well um so um so the public who cannot be in the room especially during COVID, it was kind of a challenge will have the chance to kind of see their board of health at work and what uh, some of the issues that we discuss here so that's that's part of our commitment to the, to the community netflix hasn't picked that up yet yeah. oh. <laughs> i think they're gonna start a new season in january a new season in january new season. <laughs> I I appreciate what you all, ha all have done through COVID and continue to do and look forward to continuing to partner and work together to serve our community. Thank you. Great. I really you. appreciate you coming in here and, and, you know, kind of meeting everybody today. It was it was a good day. We've been trying for a while and I'm really sorry about that, but uh, we made it happen. And now, you know, once the flu subsides a little 